brother, but it's just one of those things which I find out later I'm not too much happier. And at the time, one always imagines that it's coincidence these things occur. But uh, at the time, a well, lot to go back, before I even knew or heard about Baba, Nani and I had given up our apartment in New York and decided that we would travel. Mm. Later I found out that it was the same year that Baba came for the first time to work west in 1931. Mm. So our travels were here and there, and we were gone for about two years before we came back to America. And uh, I traveled and ended up by leaving the Baba. But at the time, I didn't know it. So, Nani, is my mother, Ruana Bogoslav is our friend, and I were walking down the Rue Combo and trying to pass on this. Nani and Ruana were very deep in conversation, and I was kind of tagging along. And I suddenly heard a man calling, Frida, Frida, very persistent. I'm not Frida, so I didn't bother to turn around. And it suddenly struck me that before Rwanda had taken the station in the Rwanda Bogoslav, my first name was Frida. So I said, Rwanda, oh, uh, there's somebody, I said, your name was Frida before, wasn't it? She said, yes. Well, I said, why not uh, turn around? I said, there's a very persistent voice here that seems to be calling you. <laughs> so she turns around and they fall in each other's arms and it turns out to be Clint and Todd. Quentin she had known for years before, uh, I mean, meeting Baba. And uh, it happened that Quentin was looking all over Paris for her under her married name, which was Mrs. Ricardo Martin, her husband at that time, or prior to that, had been a recluse in the Metropolitan, mm -hmm. the tenant, with a very fine voice. And uh, so she hadn't seen Quentin in quite a while. So Quentin knows her stage name, but somehow goes around to all her friends and says, you know where my friend Mrs. Martin is? Because nobody knew where Mrs. Martin was. They didn't know who Mrs. Martin was. So Barbara managed to meet, so we had to meet on the street. Rana, could you describe a little about Quentin and Rowano? Because we hear so little about them. Well, I really don't know much about him, excepting that Quentin had been on the stage. And uh, I think it was during the First War, that time, that she knew him quite well. And they were very good friends. Beyond that, I really don't know anything. And I know that at the time that they met on the street there in Paris, they hadn't seen each other for quite a, quite a few years, maybe. And... Uh, so Quentin said, oh, I've been looking all over for you because I had the most wonderful experience. I've just come back from India. And uh, uh, he thought, I don't know what it was all about. I said, what he was talking about. And so he said, I'll come up tonight to the apartment. We invite him to dinner. And, and I'll bring some pictures. And I'll tell you all about it. Fine. So he comes out of that evening. And... Uh, he shows us his photos of Baba. Very nice, but I was in those days very undemonstrative person. And I just said, well, I mean, sort of, let's hear what he has to say. But Nani, the minute she saw that picture of Baba, or one of them, she said, that's the man. I said, what do you mean, that's the man? Well, it happened, she couldn't remember whether it was in 31 or 32, at the time when Baba went to America. There was a photo, she said, of Bob in one of the newspapers, but she said she couldn't find any caption anywhere. And she had said to herself, someday I'm going to meet that man. So, of course, she was all agog right then and there to hear about Baba. I was just sort of, you know, non-committal and listening. So it appears that he had come back from India, and that was the time when Baba had, this was, I think, the spring of 33, they come. Baba had called all that early Western group, Margaret and Kitty and Elizabeth and Irina and others, and uh, they had to give up whatever they had been doing, and they were coming and following Baba, just like Margaret had to give up her dancing school and all that sort of thing. Kitty gave up the music. And they were to meet Baba in India. 
And then from India, they were supposed to go via China to America. And Baba was going to uh, break his sons in the Hollywood Bowl, and they were all going to get Godrealization. So, in fact, some of the women had even brought their Godrealization dresses with them. <laughs> well, this all sounded very odd to me. Because, in the first place, uh, I who is this near Baba? And I didn't know what a perfect master was, much less a perfect master. So it was all very confusing to me. But anyway, I listened. And uh, what happened is that uh, the, uh, we got to India. Baba took them up to Kashmir. And when they came back to Bombay, Baba said, I want you to do something for me. I want you to all go back to the West and pick up where you left off. So, for me, said Baba, because he can't resist it and Baba says, for you, for him. And so, they all went back. And Quentin was in London, comes over to Paris, and he wants to tell Luana about this. Well, as I say, I mean, I was left kind of puzzled about all this. Nadia, of course, was, wanted to know when Baba was going to come back. And Quentin wasn't quite sure. Or well, we were committed to uh, go home and visit my brother and, and the children and all that uh, that summer. So Luana stayed down in Paris, Nani and I went back to America. That summer, Baba came to the West and he went to Portofino. And Luana writes us that uh, Quentin had asked Baba whether Luana could come down there to Portofino and meet him, and Baba said yes. So, in the course of that conversation, uh, but prior to that, she writes and she says that after meeting Baba, she went for 10 days. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> you don't meet a person for the first time and then live for 10 days. I mean, this didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense. So then she goes on in the letter saying that she had told Baba about Nani and me. And so, Baba tells her to write to us that he was coming to England in the autumn and we should come there to meet him. Now, it took me years later to realize that was my first order from Baba. Mm -hmm. So, I said, no, no, all right, let's go. In those days, and at first we didn't know when, all right, when Baba comes. So then, Ruano writes us that Baba was going to be uh, in London, I think it was in uh, sometime in the middle of October. He was going to be there just a short time. And uh, so we arranged, in those days, you had to travel by boat. So they, she said possibly he might stop off in France. So we got a boat that was stopping in Cherbourg or in the English ports. At the very last minute, they canceled the French port. And we get a cable the day we were leaving for water saying Baba will be in London. So said, well, that's all right. Now, the boat took forever. We had to go to Halifax and pick up apples, and there are two ten four, and Nani's getting frantic because she said Baba's going to leave. And I said to Nani, we can't push the boat. There's nothing we can do about it, but just sit on it and wait. And if we're not meeting Baba this time, we will meet him another time. I mean, if it's not meant for us to meet him now, well, what, what can we do? We've done everything, and as I said, we can't push the boat. So, anyway, Nani relaxed, and fortunately, uh, Ruano had given us uh, a telephone number for the English-speaking union. She had many very nice friends in London who didn't yet know about Baba, and who naturally would want to contact her socially. So, she wouldn't give anybody her address where she was staying with Baba. But she would leave his phone number, and they could leave a message. And every day she used the phone. So we sent a, a wireless from the ship saying we were arriving in London at such and such a day, such and such a time, and she should meet us. So we arrived in London, and there's no Luano. I mean, Bob just kept all those sort of hitches and glitches all the way. And uh, so Nani sort of was on edge about that. I said, look, we can't go running around London looking for Rwanda because we don't know where she is, but we have got a telephone number. So let's go to a hotel, and from there we'll phone and see what happens. 
So I phoned the English speaking union and immediately they gave me Rwanda's phone number. And so I phoned, and who answered the phone was that the Hajia house was saying, but Rwanda, she's so startled to hear my voice. She said, but where are you? In Paris? I said, no, we're in London, and you didn't uh, come to meet us. We sent you a while. She said, I never got it. And uh, she said, uh, what happened is that uh, that same morning, when she called up to see whether there was any message from us, the operator told her that there had been this phone message from a uh, phone call from Paris. She thinks that we hadn't gotten her, her cable, that instead we were going to Paris instead of going to London to meet Barbara. And so she said, if they phone, immediately give that my phone number. So the operator never asked anything when I phoned. And I asked my Bogoslav's number, yeah. automatically she gave it to me. So I was able to get to Rwanda. And as I said, coincidence happened that Rwanda answers the phone. So I said, Is Baba still here? Yes. Oh, well, that was something. So then, what, when can we see Baba? So she went off and she came in. She, we could see Baba that afternoon at about 4 o'clock. So then I started getting butterflies. So everything was going very smoothly up to now, but now I'm going to meet Baba. Ah, he's a perfect master. What is a perfect master? He doesn't speak. So how do you talk to somebody who doesn't speak? What do you say? Oh dear, this is terrible. Uh, I was having a fit. <laughs> but outwardly, I look very calm and composed. So we arrived in time at Hygieia House. It's a funny little hotel in London. And... Uh, all the different people came to give us water, bogus flowers, friends, the ones over, especially Marina. There was Nani Gailey and her daughter just come from uh, America, so I don't know who are they. And uh, so, well, that was all right, but I was still all the time worrying about meeting Baba. And then a message comes down after we've been there a little while, saying that Baba was tired and uh, he wouldn't see us. I just relaxed and sort of, the prisoner's been reprieved. And, uh, and uh, I was feeling very sort of contented sitting there. But another message comes that as Donnie and I come all this distance to see Baba, <laughs> we could come in and just look at him. And we mustn't speak to him. And then the next day he would give us an interview. Well, that almost seemed worse. I mean, Years later, because I learned that when you meet somebody like Bob, or even just somebody here who don't know, you just uh, fold your hands like that to them. But here I'm going in to see Baba. And oh, what am I going to do when I get in there? You know, I'm just going to stand and look at him. I mean, I felt so worried about the whole thing. I just thought, what do you do with your hands? What do you do with yourself? You know, I felt all arms and legs. And oh, but anyway, I was going to have to see it through. So, to make things worse, they, they took Nani in first to see Baba. And as I say, that is a funny little hotel with sort of dim lights in the passageway. <laughs> so I was left just opposite the door, which was shut. And I sat on the stairs because there was no other place to sit in semi-darkness. And thinking, oh dear, you know, what have I gotten into? And it is all... I'm mean, I all by myself out there in that hall. <laughs> And what's Nani doing in there? Oh, well, you know, these things just get more and more enlarged as you think about them. And uh, at last the door opened, and they said, uh, All right, Rana, come in. So I came in. And as I say to this day, I just knew there were people in the room, because I could see sort of hazy silhouettes of people. And it wasn't, I mean, in those days I didn't need glasses, but it was just hazy. All the lights seemed to be on Baba, and Baba was seen in the couch. And I looked at Baba. He was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen in my life. Such a sweetness of love, expression in his eyes. I don't know what I did. I think I just, I must have gaped at him. And I don't remember leaving the room. 
And knowing Barlow, well, in years later, you know, I got a desperate picture of Barbara saying, well, I mean, she stood there long enough to take her out. <laughs> and all. Because I was in front of Barbara, just sort of drinking in his face, and the next thing I knew, I was out in that hall again. And I don't know how I got there. Because I, on my own volition, I didn't walk out there. And then, uh, oh. But I mean, it's hard to describe. I, I don't know. I, I just went, went around in sort of a haze and a fog, you know. I didn't ask Nani, and Nani what, I, uh, what she felt. She didn't ask me what I felt. <laughs> yeah, because uh, somebody once asked me, and I, when I look back now, I said, well, we didn't say anything to each other. I mean, it was just, uh, well, something had happened. That's all I knew. And uh, so we, we, we went up to... Yes, and then on this incident sort of almost put me off. Uh, here, as I say, I, I've been gazing at Bob, and he was so beautiful and all that. And we go up to Juan's room, and we started chit chatting. And then all of a sudden, this uh, dancer, this American girl, she comes and drapes herself on the door jam. Juana, Baba wants you. Juana went actually galloping out of the room. And I looked at Nani and I said, what have you gotten into? <laughs> I mean, here, I mean, I was so carried away with Baba, but what is all this other business going on? You see, you know, when you're so confused and, 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 and everything is so new that's happening to you, you know, and all these funny odds and ends of things happen. Anyway, well, we couldn't figure it out. So we did find out, though, that uh, there were two small rooms left in the hotel. And Bob was going to be there just for a few more days. And we asked Bob his permission to stay there. At least we could be near there. And uh, Bob said yes. And uh, so he told us the next morning, I mean, that night we were going to stay in the hotel where we already were. And the next morning we would come over, we were supposed to have the interview with Bob. And uh, then we could also stay there. So. All night long, I just saw this face of Bob is going to form me in my mind's eye the whole time. The next morning, then I said, oh gosh, now we've got an interview with Bob. Now what am I going to say? <laughs> what was I going to do? Now what am I going to say? Well, uh, anyway, we'll get there. So, usually as I say, I was never very demonstrative in those days, but when we arrived at this little hotel, it was in October, and just as I was paying the taxi driver, this pushcart man comes along with a pushcart full of those beautiful gold and uh, copper-colored chrysanthemums, you know, the change of petals on the different sides, big ones like this, you see. I bought an armload like this. And when I walked into the hotel, I said, what am I doing with all these flowers? I mean, I just spontaneously bought this huge thing, you see? <laughs> I suddenly was conscious of the fact that I had this arm out of clouds, what am I going to do with them, you see? And Warner said, oh, but you got those for Baba. <laughs> oh, did I? <laughs> well, I bet I can't give Baba all that, it's too big. <laughs> so I, I'll give half to Nani and I'll keep half for Baba. <laughs> so again, the same procedure. They took Nani and the Baba and left me in the hall. So I sat on the stairs with my flowers. The flowers were wilting and I was wilting. <laughs> and I was being so shy with these flowers. Now that I've got them, how can I give them to Barbara, you know? Uh, I mean, I acted like an idiot. And uh, so I walked in and Barbara was sitting there. And I came up to him, you know, instead of gracefully, gracefully presenting the flowers to Barbara, I just dropped them in his lap. Nani said to me later, what happened to you, Rana? I said, don't ask me. Just don't ask me. <laughs> and Baba signaled for me to sit down on this side. Nani and the others were sitting on that side. And having feasted on Baba's face the night before, I was too shy to look at him that day. And yet I wanted to see his face in daylight. So he would turn this way and be gesturing to Nani and do talking and all that. And then Baba would turn to me. All the time I'd been kind of looking like this to see, like all I could see was the profile. But when he turned to me, 
I saw him looking at the wainscoting up there, you know. I started looking at him. I felt too shy to look at him. And uh, he pat me on the knee like that to make me turn around and look at him. So then we stayed there at the hotel for a few days, and Bob would go to the theater any place. We we tagged along also and all that. And uh, so then uh, Bob was going to leave. So Bob had called us all in to greet us and uh, say goodbye. He had told Nani and we wanted to write to him, but he hadn't told me to write to him. I noticed that. <laughs> and uh, then he embraced Juano and he embraced Nani, and I kind of standing there. And uh, so Juano, in her impulsive way, said, Oh, Baba, kiss Juano. Well, I could have annihilated as a magic thing on me. And I just looked. So Baba turned and he looked at me and he smiled and he put his cheek out like that for me to kiss. That was my favorite the Baba for the next time. So that's how I met Baba. Then what happened? Well, then what happened is that, oh yes, at the time when we had the interview with Baba, Baba made him promise that we would come for his birthday that year. That would have been 1934. Mm -hmm. Because we met him in October 33. Made us promise, put our hand in his, both Nani, myself, and the one of the movie come for his birthday. So we thought, well, I mean, Paris is very cold in winter, and we're going to have to go down to the Mediterranean to pick up a boat uh, that's going through the Suez to get out to India. So, and also it would be reason, more reasonable than living in Paris, we went to Morocco. And that was beautiful, I love Morocco. And uh, we traveled around, and and we sat down at Fez for a few months. And about two days before we were to pick up the boat at uh, what's the name of the, the place opposite uh, Gibraltar. I forget the name of it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We were supposed to go there from Fez to pick up the boat. About two days before we were to go, we were just getting ready, thinking about it. We got a cable from Baba. Stay with, stay where you are or go to Paris, but don't come here. Mm. So that was our mm. first setback. Oh, boy. And, uh, awful. well, it was a bit startling. I mean, I, I wouldn't, didn't feel as much then as I would have later on after I was, you know, Holy Baba's at that time I was just a little bit stepping on stage. You know? And uh, so anyway, uh, we stayed then in Morocco until spring. And then in spring, we uh, went back and uh, stayed in the apartment together in uh, Paris. And uh, after we'd been there some weeks, we got uh, cable from Baba that he was coming and that one of the three of us should meet him in uh, Nassay and he was on his way to England and then from England then he was going to Zurich to stay at Katie Madden's place. So we figured that the best person to, to go would be Luano. I mean even though I know, knew French fluently at that time. She yeah, wanted to live longer in Paris and she knew her way around more and all that stuff. So we said, you go and meet Baba. So the morning that she used to go down to get her ticket, Nani had given me a check to get cash to the bank. When I got the check cash, uh, it started burning a hole in my pocket. And when we got to the place to buy Juana's train ticket, I said, get two tickets. Oh, no. Baba said, only one of us. Oh, I said, I'm not going because of Baba. I said, you, you need somebody to go with you, keep you company. And I said, this money's going to be burning a hole in my pocket. And so why don't you say I'm going? So you just get the two tickets. <laughs> but I said, it's Nani's money, so I better phone her and tell her what I'm doing with it. So I phoned her, and of course, Nani remonstrated together. And I said, but Baba said. I said, well, Baba said, but I'm going. <laughs> 
And we had a nice trip down to Marseille. We found out when the when the uh, boat was coming in, and the next morning we went down to the hotel bus to pick up Bob and the Monday and their luggage and everything. And I started thinking, oh dear, now I'm in the wrong place. And maybe Bob is going to say something. Anyway, I just have the chance that I'm here. So I said, we got down to the deck, I mean to the dock, and we saw Chanji on the deck, and he beckoned to us to come on board. I said, why don't you go first? <laughs> so she went in, and she went down to Bob's cabin, and then she embraced Baba, and then Baba looked at me, and I went and embraced him, and I murmured in his ear, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> he seemed to have not heard it, and everything went off very nice instantly. I didn't get any scolding for it. So in those early days, Bobby sometimes gave us, you know, poetic license. <laughs> and later on, I wouldn't have dared do it. And the obedience was the order of the day. But Bobby was, you know, at that time, drawing me to him. So he condoned it. So that, uh, but it, it had a nice ending. So that day we spent with Baba in, in Marseille. We got tickets to the night train, and of course we were traveling third class, nice hard benches. And while we were in the station, Kaka had gone in the next compartment to keep the compartment for one and me. And then when the train started, Baba said, "Not nah, you go to your compartment," and he and the monkey were in the other one. So we lay down, and uh, I used my coat for a pillow. And I tossed on the hard bench, and I tossed on the hard bench, and I looked over, I saw one that seemed to be a bit restless, two we both sat up, and one said, oh, I feel so hungry. Yeah, I said, I'm hungry too. And I said, I know where the food is. Mm-hmm. She said, where? I said, in Bob's compartment. <laughs> 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 I said, you're not going in there. But I said, I know where it is. I'm right on the shelf, and I won't disturb anybody. <laughs> She was horrified, but anyway, I said, well, you're hungry, and I'm hungry, so let's at least try to get the food. So, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> or the fool's tread, white angel's feet of tread. <laughs> so, I, I came to the train was rattling and making so much noise and wiggly waggling this way, that way, and I had to be very careful because Baba was stretched out on one side and with his shawl over his head. And on the other side, a couple of Monday was sitting, I think one was sitting on the floor, and I'd be very careful I didn't touch anybody that might be startled or something. But I, I got there, and I was, the, the food was on the rack just above Baba's feet. Oh, my So I was reaching like this to the box, mm-hmm. and Baba sits up for the shawl. What are you doing here? I couldn't have disturbed you. I said, all this grabbing and noise, and I haven't touched anything or anybody. But what are you doing here, said Baba. I said, we're hungry and the food's up there. (laughs) (laughs) All right, said Baba, take it and don't come back in this compartment again. All right, Baba. So I took the box and went off. Juan and I enjoyed what was left in the box. And then we stretched ourselves out. We were just going to rest when uh, Kaka appeared in the door, and he had two little black velvet pillows like that. And he said, Baba sent these to you, one for Ruano and one for you. You're to rest well, keep your pillow with you always. Hmm. I still got my pillow. Hmm. And then we reached Paris, sitting hmm. sound, and I never heard anything about my having gone there. <laughs> So then, when Bob reached Paris and he was going on to London, he told us that the three of us could uh, come to Zurich, but uh, we would have to stay. There was a little hotel, I think, down the road from where Lady Merton's property was, because <clears throat> couldn't ask Katie to take any more people. I mean, she had the Mandalay, and she had Baba, the Mandalay. Uh, the, those early Westerners that had come, and so those that were sort of later comers like we, we stayed at the hotel, but we were allowed to go up every day and be with Baba all day, but just for meals we would come down to the hotel. And uh, 
that one stay there in Zurich, uh, I realized what had happened to Rwanda when she said that she couldn't, that she had wept for ten days after meeting Baba. Because Baba was just, I don't know, taking me through hoops that whole ten days that I was there in Zurich. I couldn't sleep for ten days. Mm. I would wait for everybody in Rwanda and Nani and all to go to sleep. And then our little hotel was just across the road in, from where the lake was, and it was moonlight. And I'd sit up there in the window and look out and say, oh, heaven, what's happening to me? I thought I was being churned inside out, upside down. And there's nothing I could do about it. And I'd try to go back to sleep. I couldn't sleep. Again, I would sit up. I said, well, now I know what one of me. <laughs> so she said she wept for 10 days. She just wept for 10 days. I can't sleep. <laughs> But I had a, I had a beautiful experience there because uh, when uh, sometimes we would sit with Baba there and he would talk with us and sometimes we would go for walks with Baba and at that time Belt Myland, which is outside of Zurich, but still in its early stages there were very few houses around and there were all these hills behind where Haiti's property was because my husband was a landscape architect so they had all these terraces and lovely big stone house, you know. So we used to go walking with Baba in the hills. So one day when we were walking, I suddenly felt I've got to catch up with Baba. I've just got to catch up with him. And uh, so I, Baba, of course, was in his beautiful stride, was walking ahead of all of us. Some were dawdling, some were walking a little fast, but nobody was near Baba. I must catch up with Baba. So I started putting on his feet. Past the people one by one, they get nearer and nearer to Baba. Still, he seems so far off. At last, I was very near, and Baba obviously heard me. He looked to see who was there. And when he saw it was me, he put his hand out like that. And I took his hand. After that, I just floated up the hill with him. I don't even, I, I felt as if I had more than even touching the ground. It's just. Everything, everybody was forgotten behind. It's just problem we going up to hell again. Mm-hmm. Something I've never forgotten. So then to finish off, we uh, were allowed to go down to Marseille to see Baba off, a few of us. And we saw Baba off. Excuse me, uh, was that trip in Zurich the same one in which Baba had the meeting with the masters yeah. on the mountain? Mm-hmm. Were you there? Mm-hmm. Well, I was there, but I don't know on it from here, say, that Baba was alone there on the hillside. I mean, Max Hafiger now shows a spot where he thinks, from Haiti Madden's description, must be, because it must be a space where he could look out on all the, on the valley and the mountains across. And where this mountain was, I mean, there it was all woods, and Max said he looked all over, and there was no s- open space, or at least even a small area where anybody could have been, except in this particular part. We call it fallen fruit. And uh, Haiti described it to him up as far as she knew, because uh, she could only go so far. She drove Baba up to a certain point, and then from there they all got down to the car, and they had to go through these woods to look up to the other side, to the edge of the mountain. And then I understand that Baba picked at this particular spot, and then <clears throat> there was Quentin and Kaka, and uh, Brother Otto Mertens, or what's his name? Uh, no, what was his name? No. Hmm. Uh, yeah, what was it? I've forgotten that. Uh, he, I'm not sure what he said. There were, there were four of them that were put sort of, you know, on guard at equidistant spots from Baba. Uh, and, uh, you know, in case any interruption came or anybody happened to come that side or something, we could stop them. And I believe it rained while they were there. Mm-hmm. And the only place it didn't get wet was the spot where Baba was sitting. And that's mm-hmm. what I've heard. And uh, so when I was when I was in Italy, I mean in Switzerland, uh, in 1970, uh, Max and Gisela took me there to see the spot. Mm. But otherwise, uh, I mean, I, no, it wasn't 
that nobody talked about it particularly, so it's all just sort of from hearsay, I guess. Mm. So you went to Marseille? I so I went to Marseille and we saw Baba off. And then we came back. And, uh, oh, then that autumn, that same autumn, uh, we got a cable from Baba. Uh, telling him that we should uh, cross the Atlantic with him. And uh, Luana should give up her apartment, and uh, the three of us should uh, or rent the apartment, I forget it. And uh, the three of us should accompany him. He was going to London, and then to Southampton, he would pick up the boat. The boat both was going to share a boat, he would pick us up. And this was December. December of 34. And I'd never been in the Atlantic at that time of year. Boat was just going this way and this way and up and down. And uh, I had to walk on the closed deck every day and play table tennis with Baba. And Nani was not a good sailor. I mean, Baba kept her perfectly well the whole period. And it was one like Baba, the rougher it was, the better she liked it. And I'm very good say so I managed. But poor Adi, Adi Senior, he can't stand anything like that. <laughs> Bobby took us down to see him one day, and there he was lying in his cabin looking green. <laughs> but uh, well, we were quite delighted because we had Baba all to ourselves for, I think, about 10 days because the boat was late. And Nani had to go up to the every day and send some wireless message. In the meantime, uh, Narlina and Elizabeth were arranging these two receptions for Baba. And because they both were so late, the two receptions had to be put into one. And all the people had to be again notified that we're going to the second reception. All the first, I forget it. And uh, so, because we were very happy because we had Baba all to ourselves on that whole trip. And that's the time when I said to Baba that uh, now I know why certain things in my life didn't turn out the way I wanted them to. Mm. Because I said, if any of them ever had, I said, I wouldn't have come to you. I was if you had to come. Mm. And that was the explanation, because things used to happen. And I mean, I never was a person that took things too much to heart. All right, well, it's not working out. Well, let's forget it. You know? I mean, I'm not going to move for worry about things. But then after meeting Baba, then I realized, you know, uh, I, my, my life would have gone in a certain pattern, a certain way, and uh, I would probably have taken the trouble of going with Baba. I don't know. If I had to meet him, I probably would have, but then Baba wanted this way. When did you see him next? Oh my, 34. Oh, then I saw him in, uh, by that time then, uh, we, uh, we went out, when we landed, after about a week's time, we went to California with Baba. And Baba was there with us for about two months, in January of 35, and he uh, went up to Vancouver with the mandolin to the boat from there via uh, China. And, uh, I think I really went to Japan and not and then back. Hmm. And then uh, Nani and I thought, oh well, we had some relatives and some friends in California. New York's pretty cold in winter. When Baba's gone, we'll see these people and you know, enjoy ourselves. And in the spring, we'll go to New York. Oh no, said Baba, as soon as I leave, and as soon as you all have celebrated my birthday, which at that time we used to celebrate according to the Parsi calendar. So it would have been the 18th of February that time we were celebrating it. So after that, Bobby said, we'll go back to New York. Where were we? No, we used to, I used to write to Baba. You used to write to him? Yeah, that's after Vancouver when we went back to New York, because mm -hmm. we didn't see Baba until the 36th. That's right, you started corresponding with him. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> 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 Ooh, when, what time is this, Father Pop? Is it Pop? Um, 
Well, maybe very quickly, somewhere. Is that down? No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. 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 Mm-hmm. To see Baba, and he told us what date we should arrive in uh, uh, Bombay. And then we stayed in Paris until that time, and then Marina and Elizabeth and uh, myself and Nani traveled together on the ship. And then each time when we arrived in the port, I was looking all the time to see whether the cable. <coughs> Cable was uh, there or not, and there was no cable, so we figured that God really managed to come. And then when we arrived, we stayed first at a government rest house until the ashram was ready. Then the day before Christmas, all the Indian English people came. And then Baba uh, made his promise to stay five years, and after a few months, Baba started sending people away. And then uh, we uh, Lonnie and I and Elizabeth and Marina stayed and traveled with the uh, uh, women to Ken. And then we went, that's where we were, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, uh, prior to that, before we started on the ship, <coughs> one of the first orders Bobby Kim me <coughs> was that he would be arriving a certain morning in Bombay. So we had to leave Nasik ahead of time, the four of us, and be there a day or two before. And Bobby was arriving this particular morning with the women. And from there we were going to the docks and then taking the ship. So Bobby had told me, now, you be very careful when you come to see that there's no men in sight. No men in sight. You weren't supposed to see any. I, I could see, I had to see that there were no men in sight, so the mirror and all the women arrived. You know, the coast would be clear to go up to their bedroom. Mm-hmm. That morning when I came out from my room, as I said to myself, Oh Lord, it, it's just nothing but corpses all over the place. You look at these servants and people, they sleep in the passageway and they just take a, a sheet and put it over their head, a white sheet. So it just looks like a lot of bodies all around, you see. And every floor was like that. And I thought, <coughs> if I tried to wake these people and remove them, I don't know where to remove them to, and they won't understand my language, so it, there'll probably be a free-for-all by the time Baba arrives. I better just leave things the way they are, and just trust that they'll still be under their sheets when the women come. But I told Baba, I said, when Baba came out, I said, Baba, there are nothing but bodies on every floor covered with sheets. <laughs> <coughs> and I said, I didn't know what to do with them, and I said, I was afraid to disturb them because I didn't know where to put them. And Bob said, it's all right, are they still under the sheets? I said, yes. So quickly made the women go out and they wove their way in among all these bodies and got to the rooms before anybody pulled their sheet down or anything like that. So I felt so relieved. I said, my head was the first order Bobby gives me and I can't even do it properly. But what are you going to do with all these? It was fantastic how many there were, every floor. <laughs> so then, as I say, we had the rough journey on the ship during, going through the Bay of Bingo. <clears throat> and I had to be on duty in case some drunk or somebody wandered down that passageway. So I said to the stewardess, you know, you have to take care of the passengers and you have to bring them their breakfast, see to their rooms and everything like that. And I said, there must be times when you feel a bit queasy too. What do you do? I give a good tablespoon full of Worcester sauce. <laughs> 